Hey, did you see the government's new UAP report? Well, unless you had expectations of disclosure about aliens, you might be pleasantly surprised. Join me, John Greenwald Jr., as we take a deep dive into what the report is all about. We'll even take a look at what they conveniently left out. Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and taking this journey inside the Black Vault with me. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., founder and creator of the Black Vault. And today we are going to deep dive into that newest UAP report. Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, about a week ago, there was a report that was released by Aero, the government's UFO investigative office in the Pentagon, and they needed to get Congress by their own legislation, they passed a historical report. Now that came out, and to my surprise, it was actually, I would say, more thorough and arguably even better than I expected. Now, I always keep my hopes fairly low for stuff like this, just simply for the obvious reason of they generally aren't going to deliver what we want. And that would be the absolute truth. And when you read through this thing, albeit it is very detailed, there's a lot to it. I was surprised that it was a, um, a lot lengthier than I expected. Uh, there were quite a few letdowns along the way. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to dive into the report. Now, keep in mind, as I go over this, it is not in an endorsement of what the U.S. government is saying or claiming, uh, unless I state otherwise. I, th I think that there's a lot of evidence to the contrary of what the government is claiming, but I think overall, I think they've skirted some pretty important pieces of information. So we're going to go over the report. We're going to go over what they don't deal with, what they do deal with, what's wrong, what's right, what, what do we think about the whole thing? And as always, I'm interested in what you think as well. So if you are watching on YouTube, if you're on the live stream, uh, there is a chat room active while this premieres. Please feel free to take part, but also post your comments. That way we can see what you think, because I don't always claim to be right. Uh, when we dive into these things, I try and give as much context as possible, label my opinion where applicable. But obviously, I want to dive in with all of you guys together uh, because we're all on the same team here trying to figure this out and uh, make sense of all of this because it is incredibly hard to do. So let me go ahead then and get up the presentation here. That way I can kind of go over with you guys the report. Now, I'm going to stress to you guys, I know that these deep dives aren't for everybody. We are going to go into some of the nitty gritty details and you're going to roll your eyes just simply because you will not believe the government, you want to hear something else, they're not going to give it to you. So let me just, uh, again, say that up front. This isn't in an endorsement, but I think it is important to lay the groundwork of what the U.S. government is trying to claim, what they are trying to say with all of this, because it is important context to the grander picture. Now, the report itself, report on the historical record of U.S. government involvement with unidentified anomalous phenomena, that's the report uh, uh, title. Here's the first page of it, just so you can kind of get an idea if you have not seen it. Now, forgive me here. I'm going to move one of my screens just as we go so I don't lose you and get my laser pointer up. Sorry about that. So uh, obviously, this is the uh, title page, like I mentioned, and I want to show you guys. I won't read every single word, but this is the table of contents. Now, the table of contents gives a pretty good idea of everything that they cover. And as I already mentioned, fairly detailed. You can see here the different sections, section one, the intro, section two, the executive summary. That's what we're going to hang on quite a bit. I'll tell you uh, in a moment why, uh, but we're going to stick around the executive summary for quite a bit. Scope and assumptions of the uh, actual report and investigation that went into this. Section four, accounts of U.S. government UAP investigatory program since 1945. So they went all the way back to 1945 and work their way to the present day. Again, 
I'll give them a little bit of credit there. That's fairly impressive because there's a lot to deal with. And with that said, that's also why I'm not going to go over the whole report with you guys, even though that this is a deep dive. Uh, it's 60 plus pages or so uh, for the total report. There's uh, references and citations and so on, and there's a lot to read. So in addition to this video, if you haven't already, read it. Take some time. If you're interested in this, you may not buy into all of it. I don't. I'll tell you that right up front. But it doesn't matter. Take a look at all of the information because there is much, much more than what I'm about to deal with in this video. I'm only going to skim the surface and talk a little bit about what I feel is, again, in my opinion, the most important parts. So you can see here when they go back to 1945, they are literally going all the way back to Project Saucer, Sign, Grudge, Twinkle, Grudge, um, uh, the, the reestablishment of it, uh, Project Bear that they talk about. You don't hear about that a lot. The Robertson panel, the, Dur the uh, Durant report or Durant report, uh, Project Blue Book, all sorts of stuff is in this history. So my kudos, because that's a lot. There's a lot there. Um, but I also must add, it's also the government side of this, the, the, the what they want you to believe about some of these programs. And we'll also dive into that as well when we get to Project Blue Book. But you can see here just through the, the table of contents, all the way through the Roswell investigations, uh, there were a couple different Roswell explanations along the way over the decades. Uh, that was in the 90s and the 2000s. So they deal with all of that and right up to OSAP and ATIP and then the task force, the UAP task force, uh, and then right up to Arrow. You can see over here, they deal with NASA's study, uh, Arrow, as I mentioned, and so on. So lots lots in that section alone to go over. Um, and, and I won't be going over all of it, but just wanted to give you a rundown of what is overviewed in this report. Uh, moving on, Section 5, Assessment of Interview Claims of U.S. Government Involvement in Hidden UAP Programs. It kind of goes into what they heard through witnesses and various interviews that they did. No one is named in this report, but uh, they did give everyone a number. And later in the report, we'll go over this section. They kind of just give everybody just that, a number and no name. So you have to kind of fill in the blanks. Some you will be able to. Others, kind of a mystery. We can kind of all speculate and guess on who some of these uh, individuals are, but uh, don't expect names as we go through here. We just have to fill in the blanks. But you can see here all the different types of claims that they have tackled in this. Uh, section 6, investigation into named U.S. government sensitive programs. Again, what they learned from those. Um, just a lot here. And, and this was... Uh, a little bit of a surprise to me. You can see it just keeps going. This is more of uh, of the report table of content, uh, contents. Here's uh, section eight here. Testing and development of U.S. national security and space programs most likely accounted for some portion of UAP sightings. And then it goes into all sorts of different programs, some of which you've likely heard of, others maybe not so much. Very cool history there, but that's where it starts to veer away from, I think, um, a viable explanation for a lot of these cases and rather just gets into fluff. And that historical fluff is used to not only bulk up the report, but give Congress and anybody in the general public that reads this um, maybe something to fall back on. And they try and sell the explanation that there's a lot of government secret programs out there, special access programs, stuff you don't hear about for decades that could apply to some UAP cases. And in some cases, that's probably true, but not all. But they spent a lot of time going through all of these different programs, trying to sell that narrative. And to be honest with you, that's tried to be um, done for decades with the US government, and nothing has really even stuck. Uh, in fact, when they try and do that, like the CIA did with the U-2 flights, they generally just stick their foot in their mouth by saying, hey, remember all those 1950s UFO sightings? That was us. That was one of their tweets that they tried years and years ago. And when you actually look in the documentation, you realize it's wrong. So this isn't a new narrative for them. They've been selling this for decades. Sadly, they just keep failing at it but they keep trying again and again. Uh, so you got to give them to uh, uh, you got to give that to them that at least they're trying, but uh, sadly kind of fallen flat on explaining this away as top secret programs. When I said that we were going to stick with the executive summary for a bit, uh, I meant it. And here's why 
when you have a 60, a 70, 80, 100 or 300 page report, that's a lot to go over. You know, even for people like me who love this stuff, uh, sometimes it gets a little bit tedious. So with a lot of government reports, they create what's called an executive summary. And this essentially takes the 60 pages uh, or so when it comes to this report or however many it may be. And they shrink it all down into something that's much more manageable, readable, and uh, won't take a whole lot of your time versus reading the entire report. So I'm going to hang out here for a little bit in the report and go over some of the sections and conclusions to give you guys an overview of what narrative the government is trying to sell you with this report. I believe that there is evidence to support that they are not completely accurate here. But in fairness, I also believe that there's evidence to support that they are, and it all falls back on information that's obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, in some cases, information that's been around for decades. Sadly, this report just doesn't deal with it. So you'll kind of see as we go through here that there's stuff to support what the U.S. government is saying, and there's stuff to combat what the U.S. government is saying. And I'll try and deal with uh, as much as I can in the uh, in the time frame here for this uh, presentation. But diving into the executive summary, you can see here it starts in section two. And for those that want to follow along, you can go ahead and click on the link in the, the show's description, whether it's here on YouTube or if you're listening to the audio podcast version. Arrow found no evidence that any U.S. government investigation, academic sponsored research or official review panel has confirmed that any sighting of a UAP represented extraterrestrial technology. This obviously was the biggest blow to those wanting disclosure that David Grush has been around during the time that this report was being written and researched. The 40 people that he claimed that he talked to, those people have been floating around with stories, uh, some of which may have talked to Arrow. We don't know, again, the list of names. But there's a lot that people have wanted. So for them to just start off saying, nope, there's no evidence of aliens, kind of pop the balloon, pardon the pun, of quite a few people uh, and their expectations, their hopes, their dreams, their wants, their desires with reports like this. Because as more of this happens, as more of these reports are created and generated and they come out into the public realm, that balloon gets popped over and over and over. And that disclosure dream that some people have been claiming is underway. Some people, even former government uh, personnel, claiming that disclosure is underway and or happening as we speak. This is not disclosure in the way that many people have been preaching about. So that's going to make some people cringe a little bit. But this is the claim that the U.S. government is making in this report. They say, although many UAP reports remain unsolved or unidentified, Arrow assesses that if more and better quality data were available, most of these cases also could be identified and resolved as ordinary objects or phenomena. What's kind of frustrating about lines like that is you don't know how to solve something if you don't have the evidence. So how can you just say, well, if we had the evidence, we'd solve it and it's not extraterrestrial, it's not anything. Now, I should say, for those who don't know me, I don't argue the ET hypothesis here. I don't come at you and say it has to be alien because we can't explain it. But if we're doing a scientific study and cases don't have viable data, what do you do? Assume what that data is if you were to get it? No, of course not. You figure out a way to get it. And when you look at UA UFO and UAP history and you go back now literally decades if you want to believe the OSAB stories and the government was really funding UAP research, we'll deal with that a little bit more in a bit. But if you really believe all those stories, right, and take them for, for what they are and their UAP studies, what did they do for all those years and spent tens of millions of dollars? What did they do? They still, here in 2024, are issuing reports saying, well, we just don't have good data. Well, what in the world were all these investigative programs doing? Spending tens of millions of dollars like OSAP that we can prove. And when I say prove, we know the money went there, whether it was mismanaged or not. That's a different conversation. But regardless, if if they really were trying to investigate UAP and UFOs, what did they do with that money? What did ATIP do? If you believe all the stories there that Luis Elizondo 
headed this program within the Pentagon. What did they do? For years, according to his side of the story, it was from 2007 or 2008, again, depending upon which interview you listen to, all the way through 2017 that he was doing the ATIP program. So let's just say it wasn't even a program. It was a portfolio and he didn't even have funding for it. And he was trying to to do something when it came to UAP. What exactly did they do? And I think those are all important questions as taxpayers look from the outside in that tens of millions of dollars that we can prove have been spent or people's times and their free time, whatever, whatever the explanation is, we still don't have data to look at. So that's what's frustrating about this is that we keep hearing this over and over. And if you know your UFO history, when you go back to Blue Book, they use some of the same excuses that they couldn't solve a certain number of cases. On paper, they claim 701. But if you look at it, it's probably a much larger number. Um, they lack data. And they even said back then, decades ago, if we had data, we can solve these cases. From a scientific perspective, how can you say that, right? If you don't have the data, then you don't have the data. You can't assume what the data is. That's not science. That's just simply an explanation, not a investigation. So you have to look at the difference there. So I was frustrated to see that right off the bat in the executive summary here, that in 2024, they are continuing that line that they can't solve amount of a certain amount of cases. But don't worry, if we had more data, we probably could. Well, those are assumptions that aren't fair to make because you don't know what the data is, clearly, because you don't have it. Arrow found no empirical evidence for claims that the U.S. government and private companies have been reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. Arrow determined, based on all information provided to date, that claims involving specific people, known locations, technological tests, and documents allegedly involved in or related to the reverse engineering of extraterrestrial technology are inaccurate. Additional claims will be addressed in Volume 2. It then starts to go through a bullet point list of some of the claims that they looked at and essentially the conclusions that they came out with. And these are important to look at because, again, it summarizes a much lengthier explanation later in the report, but they interviewed uh, about 30 witnesses or so for this uh, particular report and took the main claims. And this is kind of what they, they dove into. UAP non-disclosure agreements, Arrow has found no evidence of any authentic UAP-related NDA or other evidence threatening death or violence for disclosing UAP information. A CIA official allegedly managed UAP experimentation. The named former CIA official was not involved in the movement of extraterrestrial technology. The same former CIA officer signed a memo rejecting a claim made by interviewees that he managed the movement of an exper experimentation on off-world technology. Now, we can have our guess on who the CIA official is. Um, maybe people are bantering or even figured it out. I haven't seen it by the recording of this. Um, and yeah, I might have a couple ideas, but as I start to read through this, whether true or not, and you believe the government or not, I, I'm, I don't know, uh, to be honest with you, what the right way is here. I think it's a mixture of both. But when it comes to claims like this, I kind of feel like these are the names that we've come to know and that they say things to the general public and they say them over and over and sometimes for decades, uh, on end. And when push comes to shove, and now they're under oath or giving on-the-record statements to a U.S. government investigative agency for the DOD, it's like they back up and say, "Oh, well, no, I, I, I never really, I never really said that. I never really meant that," or, or back off from the story altogether. Or maybe they've made the claims more in private. And then again, when push comes to shove, their name gets dropped to an investigative arm like Arrow. Arrow says, "Hey." What's the truth behind this? And they go, no, no, that, that's maybe a little misunderstanding. I don't know. That's speculation. I'm label, lab, labeling that speculation. But I think as I've read a couple of these things, and uh, some of which are, are in this presentation as we move forward, keep that in the back of your mind, because it makes you wonder these names that keep coming around that have been around for decades that find themselves in these programs and the claims that they make in the general public. 
when that push comes to shove, are they backing up to the U.S. government and going, no, no, actually, that's not the, the, the way it is, and they back off of it? Just something to keep in mind. Alleged UAP intelligence community document, an alleged 1961 special national intelligence estimate that was, quote, leaked to online sources and su suggests the extraterrestrial natures, uh, the extraterrestrial nature of UFOs is inauthentic. Um, yeah, pretty confident. I know what document that would be. Uh, it's uh, likely tied to the MJ-12 stuff. Uh, regardless, you know, a lot of these documents have surfaced over the years. This is what Arrow was brought and that really surprised me as I started going through this, that that's what they spent their time on. Aliens present during a DOD technology test. Arrow reviewed information related to an account of an interviewee overhearing a conversation about a technology test at a military base where aliens allegedly were observing. And Arrow judges that the interviewee misunderstood the conversation. Claimed that a military officer touched an off-world craft. An interviewee claimed that an, a named former military officer explained in detail how he physically touched an extraterrestrial spacecraft is inaccurate. The claim was denied on the record by the named former officer who recounted a story of when he touched an F-117 Nighthawk stealth fighter that could have been misconstrued by the interviewee. Though the named former officer does not recall having this conversation with the interviewee. So it's another one of those instances where somebody goes to Arrow and say, hey, I was told this by so-and-so. And then so-and-so goes in there and Arrow questions them and they go, no, I mean, I was touching maybe an F-117 stealth fighter, but not UFOs. How much of this is the interviewee's mistake? Or how much is this the interviewee truly hearing what he did or she and recollecting that to Arrow and then that person that made the claim backs off? So to me, again, there's a couple instances where you, you, you can't help but think that that is a potential uh, possibility. Test of off-world technology. An interviewee claimed that he witnessed what he believed to be the testing of extraterrestrial technology at a U.S. government facility almost certainly was an observation of an authentic, non-UAP-related technology test that strongly correlated in time, location, and description provided in the interviewee's account. UAP Disclosure Study. Interviewees claim that between 2004 and 2007, the White House requested a research institute in Virginia uh, study the theoretical societal impacts of disclosing that UAP are extraterrestrial in origin. Arrow confirmed that the study was conducted, but it was not requested by the White House. Named companies allegedly experimenting on alien technology. Arrow has found no evidence that U.S. companies ever possessed off-world technology. The executives, scientists, and chief technology officers of the companies named by interviewees met with the director of Aero and denied on the record that they have ever recovered, possessed, or engaged in reverse engineering of extraterrestrial technology. Experimentation on alleged extraterrestrial spacecraft sample. Aero has concluded that a sample from an alleged crashed off-world spacecraft that Aero acquired from a private UAP investigating organization and the U.S. Army, is a manufactured terrestrial alloy and does not represent off-world technology or possess any exceptional qualities. The sample is primarily composed of magnesium and zinc, and then it goes on from there. In other words, TTSA and To the Stars. And we can fill in that gap because we know that To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science, which has now been rebranded into the entertainment company of To The Stars Media, uh, founded by Tom DeLonge. That's how Luis Elizondo came and got introduced to the world. Uh, Chris Mellon was involved with that. Again, a lot of those names that you hear over and over. Dr. Hal Putoff, who had ties back to OSAP and Bigelow Aerospace uh, during the OSAP days. Fast forward, was part of TTSA, still is from what I understand. Uh, or at least the last I, I checked anyway. But regardless, a lot of these same names involved with that organization. They acquire a piece of an alleged UAP ship from Linda Moulton Howe. If you're not familiar, I did a, a long interview with Linda uh, shortly after she sold that piece to to the Stars Academy for what was reported as, I believe, $35,000. Um, she goes into great detail. Arrow got a hold of it. 
and they communicated with the army, which, by the way, I'm going after through FOIA, all those communications between the army and Arrow. Um, but they investigated it and found that it was absolutely uh, nothing extraordinary whatsoever. They go on with some of their conclusions. Arrow assesses that all of the named individuals, or excuse me, all of the named and described alleged hidden UAP reverse engineering programs provided by interviewees either do not exist are misidentified authentic, highly sensitive national security programs that are not related to extraterrestrial technology exploitation or resolve to an unwarranted or disestablished program. Obviously here, we're now leaning towards the David Grush slash UFO whistleblower claims that we've heard a lot about in the last year. He claimed a lot about this, that there's 40 people floating around that he talked to uh, that essentially led him to those conclusions. Whether you want to call it hearsay or not, there is still no supporting evidence that's been put forward by this with whistleblower um, to support any of that. And I think that Arrow, although has not talked to David Grush as far as I'm aware, uh, there's been a couple different varying explanations why, but it sounds like Arrow in one story did not get back to David Grush. That came from the congressional hearing that David Grush uh, took part in. The other one was that David Grush did not essentially trust Arrow or Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, did not want to get the interview done because he didn't trust them. Whichever way you slice it or dice it, uh, it sounds like that Arrow did interview people that that maybe came from David Grush's list of 40. Uh, they looked into those claims and they couldn't verify them. Now, here's what I'll say. Would Arrow have access to that? And in my personal opinion, the answer would be no. It doesn't matter that Arrow has all of this access and they claim they have access and the DOD really wants them to have that answer. Let's play a hypothetical here. If they really had extraterrestrial exploitation programs of technology that was out of this world, you would not hear from them. I just don't think you would. And I think that people that have those beliefs that are coming forward, I think some of them are genuine. I think David Grush is absolutely genuine conveying the information that he has. I'm skeptical about the roots of his claims, and I still question why he hasn't shown his Dopser review. I think that that is crucially important to this. But despite that skepticism, I do think that he's genuine. I think that he did his investigation. He, he probably did talk to 40 people. You probably recognize a lot of the names that he talked to. Or you may not recognize their names, but I bet you a dollar that, that they spoke to people that you recognized. And so I think that that genuine conveying of the information is just that. It's genuine. But if there's no concrete evidence to anybody, highlight um, or spotlight, I should say, to the public, uh, that we should have it, the general public should have it, none of that should be classified, in my opinion, um, you can't fight this. And that's what's frustrating. And I've said it for years, even prior to David Grush coming around, when you highlight stories that are just that, stories, you're going to get traction from the sensationalism of it, but you're not going to have it solidify with the general public and and really coalesce into a movement uh, if you don't bring evidence along with it. I posted on social media um, a, a week or so ago when this report came out. And I said, essentially, it's time for the quote unquote whistleblowers, and I put it in quote, to become whistleblowers without quotes. My entire point there is that, yes, we can label whomever we want as a whistleblower with their stories, but if they don't back it up with actual evidence, we can never show it uh, to Sean Kirkpatrick or Arrow or anybody involved or show it to the cameras on mainstream media and go, look. The U.S. government won't tell you, but we will. And I would absolutely, in my personal opinion, bet a dollar again that nobody who comes forward with proof of extraterrestrial technology is going to be taken away in cuffs for breaching their NDA or security clearance. Because I don't believe that it's justified to keep something like that secret or classified. 
It's why I push as much as I do on this particular topic with the U.S. government. There are some cases away from UFO stuff that I think should be classified and remain so. There's stuff with UFOs that I actually think, sure, I can understand why that's classified, like the sensor system that might be from a classified platform or radar or whatever detection system. Sure, I get it. That's classified technology and rightfully so. But the technology that it's capturing, if it truly is out of this world, shouldn't be classified at all. So it just shouldn't be. And so if somebody comes forward and proves to the world, right, they change humanity. Imagine if the U.S. government carted them off away to Guantanamo Bay and said, oh, this is where you're going to be the rest of your life and lock the key and lock the cell and throw away the key. I don't buy it. I really just don't. OK, so that's why I said, let's get those quote unquote whistleblowers to now be whistleblowers. Come out, come out with this information and just put it out there because these stories are not getting us anywhere. It's not because I don't want to believe them. It's not because I want the mystery to linger. It's it's time. It's just time for the evidence. No more talks, no more books, no more private lectures to groups. None of that. If you want to change humanity, just change it. Come out with it. And I guarantee then you would have a movement. Nobody is going to be carted away to, to, to jail for that. And you will change humanity in the process. But they're nowhere to be found. They have these secret groups and secret beliefs. And according to some people, they leak their secret breadcrumbs to bloggers and stuff like that. That's ridiculously silly. Because if there's evidence floating out there, now's the time, especially after a report like this comes out. Arrow assesses that the inaccurate claim that the U.S. government is reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology and is hiding it from Congress is, in large part, the result of circular reporting from a group of individuals who believe this to, to be the case, despite the lack of any evidence. The same thing that many of us have said for years, those that feel there is something to these phenomena, that there is something to this topic, and I'm speaking about me with that. I believe that there's something to this. But my biggest fear was that the same types of people, do they really have the keys to the cosmos that they know all of the government secrets and everything there is to know about uh, extraterrestrial technology and, and, and secret government programs, and it's all this small group of people? Or are those the storytellers and the real story is hidden somewhere else? That it's that it's not within the reach of, of a podcast or an upcoming book, but rather you have to fight for that truth. And by fight, I mean, seek it out. You have to do whatever legal means that you can with the U.S. government. I hate the war rhetoric, so that's why I wanted to correct the, 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 the fight uh, reference there. Um, but every legal way to do this and and if it and if it's a a whistleblower coming out and and giving that information that should not be legally classified that's one of those rare instances where i'd support it bring them out let's see that information uh and and yet they're they're not there it all roots to the same group of people. So now it's not me telling you that, right? It's not um, uh, mainstream media. Now the US government is saying it too. That doesn't mean it's true, but I hope that you guys recognize that, that this is problematic, that we hear those same people over and over and over with their stories and nothing is ever proven. So now the government is congressionally mandated to do this report and they're hearing from the same people coming to the same conclusion that many of us have that a lot of these guys are just spewing out stories. And that's what's frustrating because they're not looking, they meaning Arrow, at the real information, the government documents, the intelligence reports, and the data that we know is there. Instead, they're focusing on stories. And that's what's frustrating for someone like me. And I'll deal with that towards the end of this on how much they really have missed. Arrow notes that although claims that the U.S. government has recovered and hidden spacecraft back to the 1940s and 50s, more modern instances of these claims largely stem from a consistent group of individuals who have been involved in various UAP-related endeavors since at least 2009. What happened in 2009? OSAP was stood up and was underway. 
Dr. Hal Putoff, Robert Bigelow, Dr. Colm Kelleher, all of the names that we're seeing today, it seems like that's who they're referring to here, that they're the ones that are rooted to these stories. Many of these individuals were involved in or supportive of a canceled DIA program and the subsequent but failed attempt to reestablish this program under the Department of Homeland Security called Kona Blue. That's new. Kona Blue is new. Now, we knew back in January, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick had said that there was this effort to get DHS to continue OSAP. Now, in fairness to James Lekatsky, the DIA scientist who, on the, again, on the DIA side, headed OSAP, they brought that out, I believe in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon first, uh, that there was an effort to get DHS involved. But no one knew the name Kona Blue, and no one knew the extent of it. I'll bring up Kona Blue later in this slide presentation because it does go in, this report goes into more detail. But I think I'm going to hold off going into much detail on it because I smell a deeper dive on Kona Blue and what's going to come out. I, I don't have that firsthand knowledge. I don't know exactly what's going to come out. But let's just say I have a feeling that there's going to be more documentation. Uh, from DHS. I've had a case since January for it. We also know that uh, through Stephen Greenstreet and the New York Post, who was monitoring the Arrow website, noted that Kona documents may be added there. Uh, they have removed that link, but essentially it was like they were editing a live page. And to Stephen Greenstreet's credit, uh, noted that, that the report was likely on its way out because they had a dead link, but it was programmed in. And then this Kona Blue reference uh, with documents. So there was that as well. And um, Sean Kirkpatrick has also referenced Kona Blue material being released. So all of these kind of puzzle pieces are fitting together that that there's going to be more to that on what they uh, wanted to do with continuing OSAP, but failed to do it because DHS said, no, it's not of interest. Arrow assesses that UAP sightings and reports of these sightings to U.S. government organizations and claims that some UAP constitute extraterrestrial craft and that the U.S. government has secured and is experimenting on an extraterrestrial technology have been influenced by a range of cultural, political, and technological factors. Arrow bases this conclusion on the following factors. The aggregate findings of the U.S. government investigations to date have not found even one case of UAP representing off-world technology. None of the programs mentioned by interviewees are UAP reverse engineering programs, and all the authentic programs have been properly notified and reported to Congress through the Congressional Defense and or intelligence committees. Arrow has no evidence for the U.S. government reverse engineering narrative provided by interviewees and has been able to disprove the majority of the interviews, interviewees' claims. Some claims are still under evaluation. I'm curious what, what's still under evaluation. Arrow determined that a piece of metal alleged to be recovered from an off-world spacecraft is ordinary of terrestrial origin and possesses no exceptional qualities. So I'll say it again. If there really is those UAP reverse engineering programs, I don't believe Arrow would have access to it. I believe they would stay in the black world. I believe that they would not be put out to the public, and quite possibly Congress would be left in the dark as well. Uh, that is proven by decades worth of programs that have not been told to Congress, or if they have, it's a very small select group of Congress that's made aware of these and their security oaths take over, that they are properly briefed, but they don't go to a press conference or whatever and start talking about whatever highly classified program they may have been briefed on privately. So whole point being, this is all silliness to me, <laughs> because when you look at government secrets as a whole that goes back decades and decades and decades, inside and outside the UFO arena, there are secrets here that I just don't believe would come out in an unclassified report, all because Congress says, you better tell us what you did with UFOs and UAP. I think that there's enough evidence now to support that there is a massive secrecy layer over this topic, and it is not as easily dismissed as this report wants to uh, have us believe. Again, I'm not preaching the alien narrative, but what I am saying is that all of this fluff that's in here are dealing with those unsubstantiated stories. But the real stuff, the stuff that has come out through documentation throughout CIA, DIA, NSA, so on and so forth, they just ignore it. 
They just don't even deal with it in this book. They deal with the cover stories of Blue Book and Grudge and all of those UFO investigative programs, but they don't deal with the documentation beyond that. That's what's frustrating. Several factors, domestic and international, most likely influence sightings, reports, and the belief by some individuals that there is a sufficient proof that some UAP represent extraterrestrial technology. So again, they're just driving this home over and over and over about it's not aliens, but they're not dealing with the actual information and evidence that they have that has come out through FOIA and that people like me have questioned for literally decades. Arrow assesses that some portion of sightings since the 40s have represented misidentification of never-before-seen experimental and operational space rocket and air systems, including stealth technologies and the proliferation of drone platforms. I showed you in the table of contents, they show all of these different programs and so on and so forth. But what's interesting is that you really can't attribute any of these top secret programs to the military sightings that have been documented, like the Tic Tac encounter, even though I am skeptical about that being anything but a classified platform being tested, they still haven't explained it yet. So I may be skeptical and say that's likely what that is just by the story and the evidence and so on, but it hasn't been confirmed yet. And you'd even go back to the Blue Book day, some of the bigger cases like the Socorro landing that people have theories on, uh, the one where there, it was a test of a lunar la lander, another one was a hoax uh, from neighboring students. I know people have theories, but the government has never been able to connect those dots. So they try and claim overall, hey, this was us, or the large part it was us, but they don't deal with the stuff again from the military side. They kind of gloss over that. And they want the general public to believe these blanket responses. Oh, it was it was just us. Don't worry about that. And I go back to that CIA tweet. They tried it years ago with the U-2. And yet not a single major sighting from the mid to the late 50s when they were flying the U-2 lined up to anything that they could actually connect. But that didn't stop them from trying. So that's why I always press, look at the actual documentation. Look at the information that's available. Don't listen to these silly reports use these reports to work backwards and see how they came to these conclusions. If evidence supports it, great. If evidence doesn't support it, then even better. Uh, because then you get to, to see a little bit more of that picture and try a little bit harder for the evidence to support or refute what the government is saying. If it wasn't obvious already, this was volume one. There is going to be a volume two. Uh, so this particular one that we've been going over, it covers the findings from 1945 to October, the end of October in 2023 last year. Uh, essentially, that's their their cutoff date. So they have to cut it off somewhere. Then they deal with that, write the report, and then release it. Volume two will include any findings resulting from interviews and research completed from 1 November 2023 to 15 April 2024. So now they're going to they're going to go back, um, and here we are almost in April. What is it? Uh, March 19th. Once we get to mid-April, then they're going to start creating that volume two. So who have they talked to? What more information findings did they make? Who knows? Kind of a crapshoot to guess at this point, but that will then be volume two. So much more modern. Hopefully they will deal with the Tic Tac. Hopefully they will deal with some of these other cases. I know they're trying to explain away the, the go fast and the gimbal. And in fairness, they might be right. That science and the debate about glare and not glare and it's going fast. No, it's not. <laughs> that science is over my head. I don't even care to pretend to know what they're talking about with their calculations. All I know is that it's a mess. And all I know is that it's pitted skeptics against believers and everyone in between. And everybody just seems like they're caught up in those cases arguing for months and years on end about trying to solve those particular cases. It's almost, not to sound conspiratorial, it's almost like that's the plan. Like, let those things leak because... Have you ever noticed that no one really got in trouble? They did their investigation and uh, into those three videos that came out. And uh, obviously the story was completely bunk, by the way. Um, that I can comfortably say because the story we were originally told about, about the, the FLIR, the gimbal, 
uh, in the end of 2017 and then the GoFast in March of 2018, the stories behind those was just bunk, how they came out, why they came out, um, just not the same. It's not the same story. But why wasn't anybody ever really held accountable for taking information from the Department of Defense and according to Christopher Mellon, bending the rules, then leaking out, uh, don't mind my dog, leaking out, I agree, uh, leaking out the information to Christopher Mellon in the parking lot of the Pentagon. Those are stories that are being told in documentaries and podcast interviews by Christopher Mellon himself and then conveyed uh, by others with no problem whatsoever. Imagine... If they were to take information about, you know, well, I don't want to get in too much trouble, but a political figure of some kind or their family of some kind, and then bent the rules to get that out on a on a CD-ROM package and, and leaked it out to somebody to feed to the media in the Pentagon parking lot. Do you think that somebody would care about that? And the answer is yes, but it's like with the UFO and UAP stuff and the leaks that not only stopped with the FLIR, the gimbal and the go fast, but rather went all the way uh, for a couple of years where you had various photographs that leaked out uh, that it seemed like there was no problem. And then the Pentagon would even say, oh, yeah, that's utilized by the UAP task force, but wait, we can't comment past that. Really? Like, how does that not matter to anybody there? And yet when others are involved with leaking information on other topics or sneaking stuff out on a Discord server, which I believe uh, happened, they're charged immediately and they're gone after. So what are we doing here? Like, what is it with the UFOs and UAP that makes the Pentagon go, ah, who cares? It's leaking. Yet all this other stuff leaks and all of a sudden you're like, boom, 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 seeing investigation, prosecution. Uh, what's going on there? And again, it's like... That's the intention. Keep everybody screaming about algorithms and glare and not glare. And is it turning? Is it rotating? Is there really a fleet of them or not? Just keep them busy over there because they're not going to see what's going on over here. And for me, that's the greatest trick of a magician. I've talked about that analogy for years. Look at my right hand so you don't see what's going on in my left. And that is the absolute number one strategy to government secrecy. It's also why I call it the counterintelligence value to the UAP conversation, because you have no idea what the government actually knows or believes, what they have found out or what they're still investigating. You have no idea. And then you've got all these voices that have come out and they've all got different varying degrees of their story. Many of them work together, but even their stories don't align. It's like they want to mess you up with your thinking. It's like they want to mess the topic up. It's like they want to destroy what has been built for decades of those that have looked into this topic and have come to the conclusion based on documented evidence, official FOIA responses, and even outside of the government, the investigations that they've done independently have come to the conclusion for themselves there is something to this. Yet these other former government officials come along, everybody's got all these stories, nothing's backed up, and where are we at? We're with, where we're at is now we have a, a, a report that the majority of the mainstream media just bought hook line, hook, line, and sinker, and they want the general public to go, I guess there's really not anything to that UFO topic. And then you're going to see the decade, uh, the cover up last for a couple decades again, or a half a century again, and then they're not going to deal with it. And that's why I've always been passionate about pushing back on these stories, because when they're only stories, in the end, they will hurt. And I believe that this is a prime example of how they have hurt. Moving on in the report, they talk about Project Blue Book again more in depth, uh, and then they go into the results of all the varying uh, projects that they deal with from, again, the 1945 all the way through OSAP, ATIP, and beyond. And they talk about the results. And what was kind of interesting, if you didn't uh, catch up just from a historical perspective, the Project Blue Book label is kind of the stance that the U.S. government ha had had for literally decades. It became, prior to 2017 when we found out about ATIP, really the centerpiece to my research, not because of Blue Book itself, but because that was the stance of the U.S. government. What you see on the right of your screen there is the fact sheet on UFOs that the U.S. Air Force and many government agencies would send out, and they sent it out for decades 
trying to make anybody like myself believe the findings of Project Blue Book. And essentially it's verbatim. No UFO, no UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the U.S. Air Force demonstrated any indication of a threat to national security. You can see here, that's pretty much verbatim. Number two, there was no evidence submitted to or discovered by the U.S. Air Force that sightings represented technological developments or principles beyond the range of then present day scientific knowledge. You can see that pretty much right there. Scientific knowledge. Number three, there was no evidence indicating that sightings categorized as unidentified are extraterrestrial vehicles. Look at that. It's right there. So what essentially they were doing, because this is today's report, you know, in 2024, this was created decades ago. It's the same darn thing. Now, I don't expect them to change the findings of Project Blue Book, but my whole point here is that these facts that were conveyed on these fact sheets and sent out again to people like me, there were no supporting fact, factual evidence to go along with those facts. They were in quote facts. They were just kind of made up because when you actually look at the evidence, I'm not saying that it was alien or extraterrestrial. So with that reference uh, excluded on that, there were clear violations of military airspaces, training exercises, and what could be defined as a national security threat. So the fact that they're still trying to say that um, is ridiculous. So they're, they're, they're going by the same playbook. But the same evidence that debunked Blue Book as a true investigation, and rather I just label it a explanation, because when you deep dive into that history, and it is pretty interesting, but when you deep dive into it, you realize it wasn't a investigation. They were simply trying to explain to the general public almost exactly like they are doing now. Get the general public to believe what we want them to believe. Put forward these statements, these claims, and say, hey, trust me, bro, we investigated it. We are Arrow, and they said no, they're not doing any extraterrestrial recovery programs, or there's not this claim or that claim to be supported, and we believe them. So they discount all of the witnesses that came in, because they only came in with a memorandum or on-the-record statement uh, after their interview. Uh, then they go to the private sector, and they go to these aerospace companies and say, hey, do you guys have a piece of extraterrestrial technology? And the aerospace company says, well, no, we don't. And here's a here's a statement on the record, and we'll sign a memo stating that. Arrow believes them, but discounts the witnesses. Is that fair? Not really, because it's not scientific. It's an explanation. The same playbook that Blue Book did from the 50s and 60s is being done today. And you can see that they're using the exact same word from, docu uh, from documents decades ago to describe Blue Book then. And they are still doing the same tactic today. What's also kind of funny, too, is when you all you got to do is fact check. OK, I mean, again, I, I get so um, worked up, I guess you could say, just simply because they try and pass off the same stories over and over and over. And when you look at Roswell, uh, look, I don't know what happened at Roswell. I don't know if it was alien or not. What I can prove beyond any shadow of a doubt is that their explanations just don't make sense. If they really wanted to explain it away, they wouldn't have had to do so now like four different times. And when you look at their fourth explanation, because it did change from the weather balloon to then the top secret mogul balloons, and they tried to claim the flights lined up. Um, when you just hone in on this part of the 2024 report and they deal with the, the Roswell investigation inquiries, you can see here it'll go through all the different history. And again, great history. Read it. I uh, really urge you to. They come up with the same points, you know, that they've tried to drill for for decades now uh, that the, the 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 alien bodies, quote unquote, were essentially these crash test dummies that the U.S. Air Force was using that uh, those bodies that were seen in, in a hospital, because why would you take a dummy to a hospital, were actually connected to a 1956 um, KC-97 aircraft accident where 11 Air Force pilots were killed and a 1959 man balloon mishap in which two Air Force pilots were injured. So what they were doing was connecting those witnesses that saw bodies within the hospital, maybe mangled humans, hate to say it that way, but being uh, either killed or injured in these incidents. That was, that, that was the dot they were trying to connect to these witnesses that were coming forward. 
and the Roswell incident. But the, but the problem was, and again, even in 2024, they still haven't dealt with this, that the crash test dummies weren't invented until a couple of years after Roswell allegedly happened anyway. So what you're looking at there, Sierra Sam was the first crash test dummy ever to be invented by Alderson Research Labs and uh, Sierra Engineering Company uh, back in 1949. And those two incidents, if you caught it when I said it, 1956 and 1959, those were connected back to the 1947 incident. Is everyone wrong? Did they all get their dates wrong? They all misremembered? Sure, maybe. Or is this ridiculous? Is this now explanation number four not as, as truthful as they could be? And I lean towards not as truthful as they could be. Now, what's um, beyond the historical perspective on this, they do go to what we hear about a lot more nowadays, and that is OSAP and ATIP. Some people love this, and it's interesting to see how it is interpreted in different ways from those who want to believe certain things about this. Now, I've stuck with the facts. I hope you guys know that with me when it comes to ATIP and the claims that have come out over the years, uh, backed up by official documentation when I try and make a claim or refute a claim. And I do my best to stay as factual as I can. So when I got to this section, I read it with great interest. And sure enough, it actually deals with an, a, a, a very big problem that has been around for years when it comes to OSAP and ATIP. And what is the difference between OSAP and ATIP? Was there a difference? And I've pointed out that Dr. Hal Putoff, in a lecture um, c quite a few years ago now, uh, said that ATIP was only a nickname, that OSAP was the actual program. And the $22 million did not go to a program called ATIP. It went to OSAP, the contractor, Bass. That was all part of Bigelow Aerospace run by Robert Bigelow. These are all names and stories we've heard about for years. But when you dig into these claims, if you just listen to Hal Putoff, it kind of makes sense because I would get attacked, right, from people that would listen to Hal Putoff and they'd come to me and say, John, you're saying you're not finding any ATIP stuff, but this is why it's only a nickname. It's not really the program. OSAP was the program. That was the UFO investigation effort that everybody is talking about. But you have to omit Luis Elizondo because Luis Elizondo says, no, 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 OSAP was a program and ATIP was a program. I ran that program. That's what Elizondo says. So now Luis Elizondo and Dr. Hal put off, they completely contradict each other. I've pointed that out for years. And yet no one seems to, those that want to believe everybody, no one seems to care about the contradiction. They just say they're all telling the truth, which can't be true, but they just believe all sides. And I'm the bad guy for actually questioning it. But in this report, they deal with it. And they say the following note on program names, the names OSAP and ATIP have been used interchangeably for the name of this program, including on official documentation. Unlike OSAP, ATIP was never an official DOD program. However, after OSAP was canceled, the ATIP moniker was used by some individuals associated with an informal, unofficial UAP community of interest within DOD that researched UAP sightings from military observers as part of their ancillary job duties. This effort was not a recognized official program and had no dedicated personnel or budget. Don't kill the messenger on this because I know I'm going to get hate mail and this part will be clipped out and chopped up and I'll be taken out of context. But the government actually has supporting evidence of this. When you look at all the documentation that has come out, it actually fully supports what the U.S. government said. That explains the confusion on the whole aerospace versus aviation debate for those that have been around this channel long enough. I don't regret that one bit. And the reason is, is because I smelled back then there was a problem with the name that it turns out that that whole aviation versus aerospace thing was absolutely a debate worth having. Why? Because it actually led to this, that ATIP was not a program at all. It took a couple of years, but it actually was revealed that Luis Elizondo himself sent a letter to the to the Department of Defense and the Pentagon, namely the press office, to get them to change their stance on his duties with ATIP. He conceded in one of those letters that maybe you shouldn't call it, I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially don't call it a program, call it a portfolio, if you will. In other words, he finally conceded 
that this is true, that it was not an official program. If it's a portfolio that was done unofficially, great. I really wish that they would have come out with that type of a story in the beginning. I really do, because I wouldn't have been as skeptical. I would have bought it. I have reams of evidence to show that there was something to the UFO and UAP issue and that it was being ignored. And if Luis Elizondo had come out and said, hey, look, it, when I could, I was running this portfolio, would it call it whatever you want at that point? But no one really knew because no one cared. No one cared about this issue, but I knew it was important. I would be all over that. That would be something that would be completely believable, but that's not what we were told. So now the government has tried to make sense of this mess, and they're coming up with the same conclusions that many of us have had for years, that it was not a program. When I say there's evidence to support this, there are documents that have come out that used ATIP interchangeably with OSAP. Why? Because Harry Reid did. When he tried to get it in 2009 to become a SAP, that's what he referred to it as, as the nickname. That's what they wanted to call OSAP. Within DIA, they then started talking internally using that acronym because that's how Harry Reid referred to it. And it was the Advanced Aerospace Threat and Identification Program. So they had an and in there. So it was like another variation of it. So the documentation actually supports what the government is saying here. And you'll see here as we de de um, dive a little bit deeper into this section that there's even more evidence to support this section of the report. Although investigating UFO slash UAP was not specifically outlined in the contract statement of work, the selected private sector organization conducted UFO research with the support of the DIA program manager. We know for a fact that that's Dr. James Lekatsky. Why? Because it was on the original bid solicitation that was public for all, not classified, and uh, posted on the internet back in 2008, seeking out bids. They only collected bids for a couple weeks, and how many actually bid on it? Just one. And you guessed it, it was Robert Bigelow. It was falsely reported that Lockheed put in a bid as well. How that came to pass and why it was reported that way, I don't know. Uh, but clearly, this was only one bidder. That was Robert Bigelow and Bass. OSAP slash ATIP, so they're now using it interchangeably because they find it the same, also investigated an alleged hotspot of UAP and paranormal activity at a property in Utah, which at the time was owned by the head of the private sector organization, or Bass, including examining reports of shadow figures, that's in quotes, and, quote, creatures, and exploring, quote, remote viewing, and, quote, human consciousness anomalies. The organization also planned to hire psychics to study, inter quote, interdimensional phenomena believed to frequently appear at that location. DO, uh, excuse me, DIA did not seek nor specifically authorize this work, though a DIA employee set up and managed the contract with the private sector organization. In other words, yet again, this is something that we've spoken about for years right here on this channel. What was official and what was off the rails? Why is this important? Because it puts everything that's happened and that's been claimed since 2017 about these programs into perspective. What was official and what was not? OSAP was officially a forward-looking aerospace technology research exploration program uh, that uh, looked into 12 different um, types of advancements. And these programs have been done before. I found uh, another one called Project Outgrowth that happened about 40 years before OSAP. Whole point being, these are not new types of programs. This is something that, that happens. They want to look into the future. What can our enemies have? What could we have? How could we get there? So on and so forth. So what was official? It was that. What was unofficial was this UFO... UAP invested paranormal human consciousness anomalies, remote viewing and creatures that veered completely off the map. The documentation supports the first part of what I just told you, the aerospace research, the forward looking into 40 years into the future, what type of, um, of, uh, 
advancements could they have, whether it come from lift or propulsion, or again, there was a list of about 12 of them. That is all supported. Nothing has come out to support UAP or paranormal phenomena on these OSAP documents. Point being, it puts everything into perspective on what we've heard. And it also should, it won't for some people, but it should make us question some of the other claims because this is not what we were told. And at this point, you can dismiss the government report, but in this particular section, evidence exists to back it up. Just does. Don't kill the messenger. So with that said, it is right to question some of the claims from those people that have been around the same core group that the government has found at the root of some of these bigger claims. It's right to question them. And don't ever hesitate to do so. Don't be intimidated either, because there's a lot of people out there, attorneys included, that will send you legal threatening letters if you're digging into documentation like this and publishing them. That's a true story. So don't hesitate to question because there is ample reason to do so. Just prior to DOD's cancellation of the program, the private sector organization proposed as a new line of effort to host a series of, quote, intellectual debates at academic institutes to influence the public debate, which included hiring supportive reporters and celebrity moderators. I don't know what they were trying to turn that into, uh, but clearly they were trying to do something else. Um, to be honest with you, I am uh, immediately kind of thought of the Soul Foundation and Dr. Gary Nolan and what they're doing with these intellectual debates on their end. Um, obviously, he's tied into some of the same people in this group. So is that a private sector continuation of this? Are they looking for government funding to try and continue this conversation? Who knows? But it was a fascinating look inside this era of all of these types of claims and what the government has concluded. So again, I'm not here to say, oh, you got to believe the government, but I hope you see enough that you should question a little bit more than how, the gen how much the general public has been questioning in the last seven years or so. The OSAP ATIP contract with the private sector organization produced exploratory papers addressing the 12 scientific areas tasked in the contract statement of work. These scientific papers were never thoroughly peer reviewed. Instead, OSAP slash ATIP reviewed a large number of Project Blue Book and private cases and conducted interviews of UAP observers and conducted unrelated work on alleged paranormal activities at the private sector organization's property in Utah or Skinwalker Ranch. They, you can even see here that they didn't find any UAP casework uh, that was worth mentioning by OSAP or ATIP. Why not? Where'd the $22 million go? OSAP's last ATIP was terminated in 2012 upon the completion of its deliverables due to DIA and DOD concerns about the project. After OSAP slash ATIP was terminated, its supporters unsuccessfully attempted to convince DHS to support a new version of the effort dubbed Kona Blue. There's Kona Blue again. So obviously, they didn't want to let this contract go. They tried very, very hard to keep it going at DHS, uh, but obviously failed. Other history that it deals with foreign and academic investig uh, investigatory efforts. You can see here that it goes into the uh, project manage uh, or excuse me, project magnet, um, which if you look at UFO history has been around for, for quite a few years. But obviously, this arrow report goes into a lot of those uh, efforts on foreign soil to look into the UFO and, and UAP issue. Jumping to Section 5 of the report, assessment of interviewee claims of U.S. government involvement in hidden UAP programs. Again, didn't have any evidence in here that they spoke with David Grush or that David Grush gave them any uh, undeniable evidence, but essentially was talking about those claims that circulate and route to David Grush and the 40 people that he says that he talked to. You can see here, as of September 17, 2023, Arrow interviewed approximately 30 individuals. So we can have an idea now of how many people uh, Arrow talked to. They came up with two different narratives that they kept hearing over and over, what, what they labeled as the primary narrative uh, and then uh, the secondary narrative. The primary narrative alleges that the U.S. government and industry partners are in possession of and are testing off-world technology that has been concealed from congressional oversight and the world 
since approximately 1964 and possibly since 1947 if the Roswell events are included. The narrative asserts that the UAP program possesses as many as 12 extraterrestrial spacecraft. These were the stories that they were hearing and essentially that narrative that formed. Former CIA official involvement in movement of alleged material recovered from a UAP crash denied on the record. Arrow interviewed and obtained a signed statement from the former CIA official who was specifically named by Arrow interviewees. The former official stated he had no knowledge of any aspect of this allegation. Kind of curious again who that CIA official could be. The official signed a memorandum for the record attesting to the truthfulness of his statements. Essentially, the CIA guy said uh, what he did, put it on paper and signed it. I have filed a FOIA for that MFR. I'm not going to let that go. <laughs> Aerospace companies denied involvement in recovering extraterrestrial craft. We talked about this a little bit in the uh, beginning. Aero met with high-ranking officials, including executives and chief technology officers of the named companies. All denied the existence of these programs and attested to the truthfulness of their statements on the record. So all they had to do was put something on paper and say, nope, we didn't do it. And apparently Arrow believed them, which is kind of silly because what gives them the power to just say, oh, I'll sign a memorandum for the record and... Um, and that's all it takes, because as far as I know, there's probably quite a few witnesses out of the 30 that did the exact same thing. So why are they discounted? Yet the aerospace industry, whomever they are, because they're not named, they sign in a, manu a memorandum and up. Oh, well, yeah, none of the claims are substantiated. It doesn't make sense. But I do fall back on the thing I'll say the third time. If if it was really going on, I don't think if Aero knocked on the door of Lockheed and said, Hey, are you, are you, are you guys involved in a extraterrestrial crash retrieval programs or whatever? And Lockheed goes, Oh my gosh, we have to tell you guys. Now you asked, okay, here you go. I don't see that happening. I really don't. Whether or not a company like Lockheed would have that in the private sector, or if it would be kind of buried deep inside a military or, or government installation. That's a topic for another day. But let's just assume that they are. Do you think Arrow knocking on the door or picking up the telephone and setting up a meeting would make it all just kind of come out into the open? I, I don't I don't see it. You know, it's just it's it's kind of laughable the way that that uh is conveyed here in the report. And to be honest with you, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in that that meeting, like when they set it up and they obviously have to take safeguarded um, precautions because I'm, I'm guessing that they had classified portions of the conversation. So you set it, set this up in a secure room and then you sit down and you go, okay, so do you guys have any extraterrestrial? I mean, like what true or not, it just must've been like a, um, you know, a, a crazy thing to, to, to be in the room to, to, to witness. Here's another fun section. This is uh, revisiting the To the Stars Academy and the piece of the alleged UAP stuff. Sample of alleged alien spacecraft is an ordinary terrestrial metal alloy. Arrow learned through an interviewee that a private sector organization claimed to have in its possession material from an extraterrestrial craft from a crash at an unloca unknown location from the 1940s or 1950s. And it goes into uh, the various um, uh, claims about it. Arrow and a leading science, science laboratory concluded that the material is a metallic alloy, terrestrial in nature, and possibly of United States Air Force origin based on its materials. Uh, I have filed a FOIA. The, the, the U.S. Air Force origin really kind of piqued my interest a little bit. Uh, so I have filed FOIAs, as you can imagine, on that as well, seeking out the communications between Aero, the Air Force. What scientific analyses did they do on this to try and get it? Because... When it comes to the Army's agreement through the CRADA, what's called the CRADA, and to the STARS Academy, that will likely be exempt because it, it may be proprietary information exempted under B4, uh, which is very frustrating. I've run into that already with researching the CRADA, um, but regardless, that may be a roadblock. But if Arrow obtains the piece and does their own independent investigation, I do not believe that should be exempt and I will fight it if, if they try it. So it's no longer because it was obtained with permission. 
it is no longer proprietary because nobody funded it from the corporate side. The U.S. government did. So whether or not I will get it or not, that we'll, we'll see. Uh, but my whole point being is that I don't believe they have any legal ground to say, oh, we, we're going to exempt this uh, for proprietary reasons or corporate secrets or whatever. Um, I believe that that should be open. So I have filed for all of that. But interesting to note, they got that material, tested it, uh, and, and came up with nothing. Here's that section that I talked about where they revisit Kona Blue and give a little bit more detail. And it was pretty interesting because I, I, I do kind of sense that there will be more information coming out on this. So I'll do a, a future video. But just to give you guys a brief overview, Kona Blue was brought to Arrow's attention by interviewees who claimed that it was a sensitive DHS com uh, compartment to cover up the retrieval and exploitation of, quote, non-human biologics. Kona Blue traces its origins to the DIA-managed OSAP slash ATIP program. That quote, non-human biologics, there's only one guy that really spearheaded the use of biologics in the last year or so, and that would be David Grush. Is this connected to the claims that he believes and, and that he's conveyed to Congress? Did someone go to David Grush and connect this Kona Blue program uh, and claim that it was a sensitive DIA, uh, DHS compartment to cover up the retrieval and exploitation of non-human biologics. Because if that part is true, it connects back to, you guessed it, the same small core group of people that have made grandiose claims for years and even decades about UFOs, UAP, and aliens. They always seem to be connected to these types of stories. So the fact that that is in quotes, non-human biologics, and that is something that we've heard from, from David Grush, we can start to piece together potentially who his list of 40 is. And that would probably include Dr. Hal Putoff and those that were surrounding the OSAP slash ATIP program. They turned around and fed David Grush the non-human biologics quote claim that the Kona Blue program was covering that up. Obviously, the Kona Blue program didn't exist on that level to cover it up. It never was stood up. But if that's what he was hearing, in fairness to David Grush, he probably heard it from people he thought were legitimate. That's speculation there, but I found it incredibly intriguing that the non-human biologics was in quote, uh, in quotes, as connected to Kona Blue and the, the DHS extension of, or at least the proposed extension of OSAP slash ATIP. When DIA canceled this program, its supporters proposed to DHS that they create and fund a new version of OSAP slash ATIP under a special access program. This proposal, codenamed Kona Blue, would restart UAP investigations, paranormal research, including alleged human consciousness anomalies, that's in quotes, and reverse engineer any recovered off-world spacecraft that they hoped to acquire. This proposal gained some initial traction at DAS, DHS to the point where a prospective special access program, or PSAP, was officially requested to stand up this program, but it was eventually rejected by DHS leadership for lacking merit. So obviously, it got traction at DHS. That really piques the interest of me, simply because you're looking at a paper trail there. Uh, now it's no longer just a proposal or a one page one off, but rather a paper trail on who was interested in this. Why would they be interested in it? Why would DHS want to look into human consciousness anomalies and, and go from there? So those paper trails are golden. I love stuff like that. Live for stuff like that. It is critical to note that no extraterrestrial craft or bodies were ever collected. This me uh, material was only assumed to exist by Kona Blue advocates and its anticipated contract performers. This was the same assumption made by those same individuals involved with the OSAP slash ATIP program. That obviously ties right back to the same core group of people. Those names that we've heard quite a bit about and even from in the last seven, eight years. Robert Bigelow, Dr. Hal Putoff, Dr. Colm Kelleher, all the people that were involved in that original OSAP program. Fast forward to the Kona Blue proposal. That is what the government is seeing. All roots to those people. Yet absolutely no evidence exists according to this report. 
So I'll revisit my statement one more time. It's time for the quote whistleblowers to become whistleblowers without quotes. If Dr. Hal Putoff truly has the key to unlocking the cosmos here and that he was involved, it's time to come out with it. If any of the people that David Grush talked to, all the, the list of 40, and I'm completely wrong that Dr. Hal Putoff is on that, that list, that's fine. We know Dr. Eric Davis is by his own admission. Uh, he has posted that on Facebook, that he's one of those people that fed David Grush information. Then let David, or excuse me, let Eric Davis come out and bring that information with him. Time to become a whistleblower. Stop with the Facebook posts. Stop with these private organization lectures where you hint and drop breadcrumbs. Stop with teasing a book for years on end. If there is something there and people are holding the keys to unlocking this for us all, who are the gatekeepers? The government? Maybe this report truly did convey the road all the way up to the roadblock that they met and they didn't know that they were at a roadblock. And the Dr. Hal Putoffs, the Dr. Eric Davises, the Luis Elizondo, the David Grushes, the list of 40 witnesses, who then becomes the true gatekeepers of these secrets? The U.S. government? No, because I'm sorry, I don't believe Arrow would have the access. There, I said it. I don't believe that they would be able to get a Lockheed Martin to just come clean and go, okay, you guys are asking, so we'll tell you. It ain't going to happen. So the people that are dropping the breadcrumbs, if they really do have the secrets, those are the gatekeepers. And you don't need to take my word for that. Just look at the definition. They are holding the secrets. If people want to fall back that they have security clearances and this, that, and the other thing, fine. But I will still give my opinion and say that there is no way that the government will cart them off if they change humanity as we know it and prove that there are non-human biologics floating around in our atmosphere, flying extraterrestrial technology and being reverse engineered in the private sector. Not going to happen. I just don't see it. So now's the time. Drop the quotes around whistleblower and become a whistleblower and bring the evidence. Because after all these decades of people making these claims, if they don't have it, then it's time to just stop. <laughs> okay. It's time to just go away. If you really have it, but you don't want to show it, then it's time to go away. If you really have it, but you fear reprisal, if you're not going to show it, then just go away. Because this report stems from the same core group of people making these claims, and this is where we ended up. So no congressional legislation is going to change that. No government report is going to change that. No whistleblower without backing up their claims is going to change that. What do you need? Evidence. And that's what they have to do to come out at this point. I said it months ago on social media, years ago, maybe even now it's time to put up or shut up. And that's it because there is something to this topic that warrants further scientific investigation. Stop ruining the idea and concept that more scientists will want to investigate this by just conveying these stories that lack evidence because any real scientist, once you get their attention, is going to look our direction, right, to the conversation that we're all having. They're going to look at those stories and realize their stories. What is being put in the spotlight above all else are stories that lack evidence. So let's prove it or get out of the way and let the scientists and those that, that really can do a true scientific endeavor move to the forefront of this and take it to the next level to get the data they need to solve the mystery once and for all, or at least take a step. Because those types of lectures, the podcasts, the YouTube thing, things, none of that pushes this forward. It only pushes it forward to the, to the believers that are already pushed forward on their own. They don't need to be pushed anymore, but they feel like they're more validated. That's the only thing that comes out of this when you actually lack evidence, but still convey your stories and write your books, do your podcasts and do your YouTube videos. That's the only thing that happens here because Congress is losing interest. I'm sorry, they just are. There's a dwindling number of people that are talking about this. Legislation isn't passing for a reason, 
probably because it's not worded correctly. None of that stuff is happening the way that it should. So it's time for the evidence or just get out of the way. There's enough evidence to support that scientists should be involved. That I believe wholeheartedly. But if you highlight the stories, they don't care. They're just going to make fun of it. I think it actually started raining here. Hopefully I don't lose power as I'm recording this. Arrow, Arrow has determined that modern allegations that the U.S. government is hiding off-world technology and beings largely originate from the same group of individuals who have tied to the canceled OSAP ATIP program and a private sector organization's paranormal research efforts. They are punching this over and over and over. And I believe there's a reason for that. You can see here in the next highlighted passage, I won't read it all because it gets really kind of confusing with all the different numbers and so on. I told you there were no names, but they rather gave the interviewees numbers uh, and they they labeled the people that they, they um, talked to. Uh, you can kind of see like the breakdown of who they were. Uh, you see a couple of them have rep repeatedly voiced these claims in various public and private venues, and they have petitioned Congress in various capacities on UAP issues. They've not provided any empirical evidence of their claims to Arrow. That could absolutely very much be true. <laughs> and all you have to do is look at some of the names I've rattled off, some of the names I haven't rattled off, and look at the contributions that they have. Really cool stories, but they don't back it up. And Arrow is telling you the exact same thing. So dismiss Arrow, and I'm telling you the exact same thing. Dismiss me. Look what the government came, came with. Pick one, right? Dismiss us both. Look what other people are saying. Look at what smart scientists are saying that are outside of the UFO arena that have taken the time to look in. What do they say? Stories. Hearsay. You see a lot of that over and over and over. What is lacking? Evidence. This breaks down all the different types of people that they looked at. I also uh, want to point out that they they give a lot of those uh, different program names and and projects that they want to attribute to UAP. And when I say they, the U.S. government, and you can see some of the stuff uh, going back to the 1940s with the Manhattan Project, that they're trying to connect the excessive secrecy behind some of these programs and some of these designs, like what you see on your screen now, to UAP and the encounters that we've seen. Now, no, they're not trying to claim it's 100%, but they are trying to claim there's a big connection. Well, like I pointed out earlier, and I'll point out again, there is no evidence to connect some of these bigger cases that we've talked about that are documented in government files to some of these projects. They've tried before. They failed before. They're trying it again. Why they think they'll succeed this time, I have no idea, but that's what they're trying to do. Silly, but that's what it is. Now jump down to section nine, the conclusion to date arrow has not discovered any empirical evidence that any sighting of a UAP represented off world technology or the existence of a classified program that had not been properly reported to Congress. Um, look, the first part of that. Okay. We keep hearing that over and over the second part of that would arrow have access to those programs that have not been reported to Congress. My guess would be no. So that to me is just kind of like what it is, what it is. I just kind of put that in on the back burner and don't really look at it much. But that being said, that was their conclusion, right? All summed up in these two paragraphs here and that volume two is on the way, hopefully later this year. So look, as I just kind of went over, there are things in this report that absolutely are bunk. They're silly. I think the government is putting their foot in their mouth in a couple of these areas, some of which I've gone over. Uh, you look at the history and, and what they've talked about. Uh, I dealt with Roswell a little bit, Project Blue Book. You look at all the silly explanations, which, by the way, going back to the Roswell thing, I didn't point this out earlier. They did not mention in this report that a lot of the documentation was destroyed about Roswell. The GAO came out with that in their report, yet Arrow conveniently leaves it out of this report, just simply saying, oh, it's Project Mogul balloons and so on. So again, doesn't really equate to alien when you look at that, but it just shows you how silly it is when you look at the evidence or the lack thereof, and then you see what the claims the government is trying to make. They don't really match up at all. But they go through a lot. And I was very pleasantly surprised when I saw that because they did go into that that history. And it's important. Whether or not you believe it's a real investigation or you believe the findings of Blue Book and all those programs, that's irrelevant. It's important history to understanding the topic 
and understanding how we got here today. But what I was also uh, surprised, but not pleasantly uh, surprised about, was what they ignored. And it was the fact that, and this goes back to what I've said for years, when you spotlight the stories and you spotlight the stuff that lacks evidence, when you put that in front of somebody who finally is taking the opportunity to look at it, and you kind of essentially put all that out front, and they look at it, and there's absolutely nothing to support it, what happens? You get a report like what we just went over. Stuff that dismisses the grandiose claims, which in some cases is likely very warranted. But what about the stuff that they do have? The evidence that the government has come clean about, although sometimes you have to fight for it through FOIA and, and uh, appeals and, and lawsuits and litigation. But when that evidence comes out, what happens to that? And in this report, they didn't deal with it. One example would be the, the fact that it was about a decade where the U.S. Air Force, that one military branch that is surprisingly mum and has been throughout this whole conversation, playing very little role in the public part of this conversation when it comes to UAP, had on the books through the late 90s, early 2000s, all the way to the late 2000s, a regulation to report and document unidentified flying objects that their military pilots were encountering. I have documented proof that when I went to the one receiving end, which was NORAD for these service reports, they said, well, we, we were not subject to FOIA, but they did look under a NORAD regulation where they try and mimic and honor the spirit of the FOIA that they found absolutely nothing, no service reports on UFOs. And the reason why NORAD was not subject to FOIA was because they're under Canadian control as well. So U.S. law didn't apply. Well, to quickly summarize the end of this story, the Canadian government sent me hundreds of service reports that went through NORAD on unidentified flying objects. My whole point, the U.S. Air Force and their history of post-Project Blue Book of investigating UFOs was not only covered up, but on top of that proven by the Canadian government, Arrow doesn't deal with those types of things at all. Why are military branches and government agencies lying about their UFO and UAP information? And why have they lied for decades if there's absolutely nothing to any of these claims? That doesn't make sense. They also don't talk about the intelligence files because when you dig, even post Project Blue Book into the 70s and beyond, they talk about UAP material being carried, hand carried to somebody's office within the CIA, that there was some type of UFO something that was connected to a case that piqued the interest of the CIA internally. This document actually goes on to talk about an informal effort to essentially keep tabs on the UAP conversation. This was years after the U.S. government completed their investigation and they maintained interest. The CIA was still actively involved. The National Security Agency has hundreds of communications dealing with UFOs that blow well past the Project Blue Book era and go through the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, most of which are classified top secret to this day. When I tried to get these further declassified and get these redacted redactions lifted, there are hundreds of these pages. The NSA lost each and every one at least so they claim. So these redactions will stick forever. doesn't matter what congressional legislation is passed. It doesn't matter what UAP Disclosure Act is, is, is created. It doesn't matter. According to the National Security Agency, it's all gone anyway. The originals were destroyed, and these redacted with black and white out are the only things that remain. What is so secretive about the intelligence on UFOs that is being collected around the world. Sources and methods? Absolutely. Redact that. Is that all of this? Likely not. So what is it that they're hiding? But the NSA isn't alone. You look at the Defense Intelligence Agency, this is only two of numerous pages that are found within the DIA's files of heavily classified UAP and UFO-related material. I received these in the late 90s, and there are hundreds of them. I, years ago, did the exact same thing with the DIA that I did to the NSA, requested what are called mandatory declassification reviews to try and get all of these redactions lifted. 
By the way, they didn't even use black ink. They used a razor blade to cut out these pages and photocopied pages with holes in them because they didn't want to waste the ink. When I finished the cases and the MDRs got to the end, you know what the DIA said? They lost each and every one of their intelligence papers on UFOs. So these documents here that are keeping tabs on UFO-related information and even here, a UFO research organization in China, they're all gone. They're all lost to history. No congressional legislation, no UAP Disclosure Act are going to bring these back from the shredders, at least or so they claim. Will they make the government actually come clean and say, yeah, we were lying for decades and uh, we actually do have all of these? Well, we can only hope, but probably not. The report also didn't talk about the excessive secrecy that remains to this day. And if you ask me, it's a lot worse today than it was decades ago. In fact, it's a lot worse than it was just 10 years ago. This is the security classification guide likely has been revised by now. I've got multiple cases for um, more recent versions, but regardless, I expect something very similar to this blacked out top secret, top to bottom. They do not want you to know why they are keeping UAP and UFO information secret. This guide actually defines the secrecy. This is what is, is used by our U S government on UAP information to say if UAP information is classified. And today, everything is. Where does it stem from? This guide. But the UAP report doesn't talk about any of that excessive secrecy. In my opinion, not only is this secrecy excessive, on top of that, they are employing tactics, including a law enforcement exemption, to take Arrow's files and keep them secret. So if they're not classified, or if I, by some stroke of luck, can fight what's called a B1 exemption, classified because it's secret or, or top secret, if I'm lucky enough to try and fight that, there's already a second layer that they've put on that stems from exemption B7, or a law enforcement investigation. I have appealed those on numerous occasions. I've lost each and every one. I always like to highlight the successes when it comes to appeals, but sometimes you have to highlight the failures. Why doesn't the report, the one that we just got this year, talk about this excessive secrecy? It's not all sources and methods. It's not all classified platform sensor technology. And how do we know that? Easy. When a Russian jet decides to spray gas over one of our MQ-9 Reaper drones, we have a video circulating our media like that. They review it, they declassify it, we see it in full, it's crystal clear, it's beautiful footage, and you see the Russian jet go and spray fuel. What's my point? There is something about UAP information that they don't want you to see. They hide behind the sources and methods explain, explanation and exemption. They hide behind the, well, we can't tell you how our classified platforms work. They hide behind that. But what they don't want you to realize is putting the pieces together of this puzzle, that they'll show you that Russian jet spraying a highly classified platform like the MQ-9, but they won't show you anything about UAP. Why not? What's the difference? There is no difference, or at least there shouldn't be, if we are to believe what they're trying to sell in this report. They also don't talk about our spy satellites, how the fact that the National Reconnaissance Office has a highly classified platform called Sentient, which sees tic-tac-shaped objects, very much like the 2004 incident, but all the way into the last couple of years. What are they seeing? What software or what ability within the Sentient system allows them to see and detect these tic-tac-shaped objects? This was a highly classified top secret briefing on one of those um, observations. The report doesn't mention anything like this, at least not the public one. They just want to pass off that it's not extraterrestrial and it's not anything they can't explain if they have the proper data. They clearly have the proper data. The data is there seeing these tic-tac shaped objects. And yet they don't deal with that in the report. Maybe volume two. They also don't deal with the highly classified nature of this report and topic. So the report is unclassified. 
They give it to the public, but they don't deal with the real secrecy behind UAP. This is a declassified, also top secret memo on unidentified aerial phenomenon. Now they call it unidentified anomalous phenomena. You can see here it's only declassified because they redacted almost every single word. That's the secrecy that this is on. That's the level that all of this is on. Why? If all of this is easily dismissed and really does stem back to a core group of people that are kind of creating these cockamamie conspiracy theories, fine. I can understand that in parts of the conversation. But the report conveniently left out the real stuff, the real information, the real question marks that people like me have. Sure, we can argue all day long about gimbal, flair, glare, speed of the go fast, whether or not Luis Elizondo really headed a tip, whether or not David Grush has firsthand knowledge or not, whatever. We can argue until our face turns blue. The bottom line with those arguments is we don't know the answer at the end of the day. But the report doesn't want you to look at this and ask about this. They just want to deal with that. Greatest trick of a magician. Look over here so you don't see what's going on over here. And that is exactly what this report has done. That is exactly what they want you to believe. There's nothing here. There's nothing to it. Stop asking questions and stop looking for answers. We've explained it. We did it through the 1960s, the, the, the Project Blue Book era. We solved it. No, they didn't. Evidence showed otherwise. Why would they have to change their story on Roswell so many different times? Why are dates not matching up while they blame all the witnesses? None of that makes sense. So even though there's a lot you can prove with this report, and to give the government credit, they did a lot of homework on it. They conveniently left out the information that you don't hear as much about. It's not as sexy as somebody going up to Congress under oath saying, well, I heard stories about non-human biologics. That's sexy. That's headlines, right? That's what you get in the spotlight. But is that really what we need? Until we see the proof of that non-human biologic, let's look and ask the important questions on stuff we can prove and fall back on with actual evidence. That doesn't mean it just has to stay with FOIA. FOIA is not everything. A lot of my haters always say, John thinks FOIA is everything. No, it's not. It's just what I love more than somebody's story. And I stand by that, but it's not everything. And no one can ever cite where I've said it, but it's a great starting point. And I think that when the government agencies like the CIA, the DIA, the NSA, the Pentagon itself, all has pieces of the puzzle that when put together, negate this report, it's worth asking about. And it's worth paying attention to. Less about the stories, more about the evidence. That's what I'm all about. Listen, I hope you learned at least one thing throughout this uh, presentation. Obviously, as I said up front, it is not everything. There's a lot in this report. I, I urge you, don't just judge it uh, on what I say or, or what other researchers say or media outlets or bloggers or whomever. Uh, don't. Read it for yourself. Take in what works for you when it comes to uh, information that you want to stick with or dismiss, whether that means you believe the government or not, whether that means it supports Luis Elizondo or not, whether it supports David Grush or not, whether it supports the whole OSAP movement or not, doesn't matter. Read it. I really urge you. I'm a big advocate for people having access to this information. That's why I run the Black Vault. That's why in the links below uh, here on YouTube or if you're listening on the podcast platforms, uh, it's under the Black Vault Radio. If you're not aware, you can get these types of, of shows uh, th through those podcast platforms. Look at the show notes. I offer links. If you found it worthwhile, please hit the thumbs up button. I shoot for five stars on the audio review. So please uh, take a moment. It's a huge help to me. Offer, offer those uh, reviews. I, I won't tell you what to put, but I do aim for the five stars. I do aim for the thumbs up. And if you are on YouTube, you're new to the channel, please make sure you're subscribed. Turn the notifications on. That way, when these videos do drop or I do more live streams, take your questions live, you'll be notified. That said, this is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.